Hello everyone, welcome to PMFIS Current Affair Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is your third part of the test number 7 and in this video we are going to discuss the next 20 questions that is from 41 to 60. But I hope that you have so far enrolled in our test series which is now available for the practice of upcoming UPSC prelims 2024. These are 1000 high quality MCQs now available at just price of 499. If in case you have not yet joined it, I recommend you to check out the test series and boost your score for the upcoming prelims. The link is given in the description below. So the question number 41 which was asked in this test was a very important question because you think of renewable energy, you think of uh, you know diversifying India's energy dependence. Definitely hydroelectric power is one such prominent reliable energy that we are looking looking at right so this question was with respect to the national hydroelectric power corporation that was the question about so there were three questions the three statements and you were supposed to figure out the correct ones right so what what we need to know about this power corporation uh, about the uh, nhpc limited the very first thing is this nhpc limited this is india's leading hydropower company where we have a total installed capacity of more than 7000 megawatt of the renewable energy now do we need to remember that well i don't really think you really have to remember these kind of facts because upsc don't really ask about the facts but yeah you should have a general idea about like how much uh, you know approximate uh, cap uh, installed capacity do we have and especially when it comes to the hydropower electricity so this first statement first thing you have to remember that yes it is the nhpc that is taking care of all the hydroelectric power that we have and that that is having the major chunk in that where where are the headquarters the headquarters of nhpc they are in faridabad haryana though there are no such um, hydroelectric power plants approx of course in haryana you do not have that many uh, hydroelectric power plants but the headquarters are there so this is something you need to remember you can't do any guesswork it's a fact based thing right and we established the nhpc limited way back in 1975 now you must be uh, aware that all the psus the government public sector undertakings they are categorized into different different ratna categories like some are maharatna some are navratna then you have mini ratna categories so and, and I'll tell you what exactly this category is, but as of now, you need to remember the uh, first thing that NHPC, it's a mini Ratna category one. There are two categories within mini Ratna category one and category two and how they are categorized. Of course, they are categorized based on their profitability, uh, based on their turnovers, net worth. Like for example, in case of mini Ratna, for any PSU to be categorized as a mini Ratna category one, there are certain conditions. Number one that particular company must have a profitability in the last three consecutive years means it should be a profit making PSU it can it cannot be a uh, uh, you know loss making PSU the first first priority is there has to be profit last three consecutive years number one number two there has to be a positive net worth and that is possible only if the company is making profit con uh, on a continuous basis and how much profit the pre-tax profit like before the taxation part the pre-tax profit needs to be somewhere around 30 crore or more in the last one of the three years if all these three categories are satisfied then the PSU is given the tag of mini ratna uh, category one so in this case the NHPC lies in that particular category just to give you a little bit more information about the ratna ratnas and and i've seen question coming as a match the following kind of thing so remember the first category the highest status of the psu is the maharatna status uh, there are preconditions for any company to be considered as a maharatna it already should have a navratna status it must be listed on the indian stock exchanges with a minimum prescribed public shareholdings the ad average annual turnover needs to be more than 25,000 crore in the last three years. The average annual net profit should be more than 15,000 crore in the last three years with average annual profit of more than uh, 5,000 crores after the taxation part. 
and that company that that PSU must be having a significant global and international presence so these are the categories for Maharatna then you have then you have another category called the Navratna category so in Navratna you have these kind of uh, you know I'm not I'm not reading out all that the point is you must be aware that based on different different profitabilities and all so when you download the PDF you can you must prepare this topic so similarly we have the Navratna categories with with a certain percentage of turnovers and profits and all that and then you have this the third category we have the mini Ratna and mini Ratna further classified as mini Ratna category 1 and the category 2 and category 1 was where our NHPC fits in right so that was that was uh, an important uh, part of the discussion where you must be aware of these categorizations of the PSUs. Now if you look at the question all the three statements are absolutely correct. Now how to guess how to solve this kind of question. Now obviously as the name says National Hydroelectric Power Corporation it is very obvious that it is supposed to be leading hydro power company right. Okay now this is about what common sense that we consider hydroelectric power as a part of renewable energy so if you know this information doesn't matter uh, very very less chances are there that the uh, you, you know facts can go wrong so you don't worry about the facts you must have a rough idea you are still good to go so first statement has to be correct anyways of course the the real challenge and second NHPC is a very famous uh, uh, PSU and if you have read even once you can remember the headquarters the real challenge was this this was a challenging part because it's very difficult to guess that uh, it, it, if, if a company is a Maharatna or a, or a Navratna or Mini Ratna the only thing is I recommend you to at least read read the major PSUs the, like you, ju you just have to read uh, which major companies are part of Maharatna which are part of Navratna Mini Ratna they just have a just have a reading so that in in the actual exam you don't face at this kind of trouble right so of course this question I would not say it was an easy one of course this question was a tough one given the facts involved uh, but you you can still take a risk because at least the first two statements are comparatively okay they are comparatively easy otherwise if you if you have absolutely no idea if you have no idea about the headquarters no idea about the status then of course it's better to skip than take take a risk in that case so answer is supposed to be c because all three statements are correct in this case okay now that that takes us to the next question that is question number 42 this question was again with respect to the hydroelectric project which hydroelectric project the kupa kupa pumped hydroelectric project okay the uh, the two statements but we very careful the question was which statement is not correct so very careful uh, sometimes you, you know the answer but uh, you make a mistake of choosing correct or not correct kind of thing right now in case of not correct so be uh, careful now talking about this um, uh, you know kupa pumped hydro storage project it belongs to the government of Gujarat first thing is first this is an important fact so government of Gujarat recently is going to invest more than 4000 crore rupees in this proposed 750 megawatt Kupa pumped hydro storage project number one. So two, two three things you need to remember first is the capacity of the project number two the government involved two things are absolutely important. Then you have the uh, then you have the involvement of the NHPC because I'm talking about the hydro storage or hydroelectric project of course NHPC has to be part of that because we have just learned that it's the it's the uh, you know main implementing agency so NHPC along with the government of Gujarat they have planned to develop and utilize the pumped hydro storage as an effective solution for the energy storage okay so you see the involvement of NHPC here as well now second thing you need to remember why this project is so important the project is so important and it has a national objective associated with it because by this project we are aiming for a clean and green energy why and how because you know that India has a plan of attaining 5500 gigawatt of renewable energy by 2030 that is our aim initially it was somewhere 450 but considering and given the progress that we have achieved in the renewable energy we have upgraded our target now India is aiming for at least having 500 gigawatt of renewable energy by 2030 and we are very much progressing on that path 
and in that particular uh, achieving renewable energy of course the hydroelectric power is going to be a very crucial along with solar and the wind so solar wind and hydro these are the three major focus on renewable energy and once you are going to promote and uh, expand your renewable energy capacity very obviously it is going to be helpful for achieving the net zero target that india has committed uh, in the in the conference of party so india has this uh, commitment by 2070 india wants to be net zero uh, country net zero emission country means the the number of carbon emissions emitted are going to be balanced by those carbon emissions absorbed so that that balance needs to be achieved by india by 2070 that's that's our commitment right so if you look at the question you will see both statements are correct in this point now of course it's very very difficult so second statement is still easy to remember because i can still make a guesswork okay if there is any hydro project of course this is going to be this is this is still relatable but the first point is with the problem that if it is gujarat government or not this is a pure fact based i don't know if, if the kupa is government it could be andhra it could be maharashtra so of course this was a tricky part so that's why I'm putting this question as a medium level question. Um, you, you can take a risk in that case if you have, if you have read about the Coupa one. But um, uh, be careful because, because uh, there, are, there are a lot of chances UPSC is going to trick you with which state the project is located at. right? So be careful, very, very careful. In this case, both statements are correct. But the question says which is not correct. So answer is supposed to be D, neither one nor two, because both statements are correct. None is incorrect. So that is also very important. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you, you know, if you know the answer, sometimes students say, okay, uh, the question is asking the correct one. If, if you would have given the answer as C, you really have missed out the marks, right? So be careful if the question is asking correct or not correct. So be careful with that case. Question number 43, very general question. I do not have to be a master or champion of this uh, uh, question. I can still solve it with a very common sense. The question was with respect to the cyber security vulnerability. So you know the word cyber security. You know the cyber security vulnerability would be what? I mean, all the weakness in my cyber security, all my vulnerabilities through which somebody can hack or somebody can attack a, or pull a cyber attack on me. So that is the meaning of cyber security vulnerability, like how vulnerable I am to the cyber attack. That is my cyber security vulnerability. So consider that and just read the statements with a very calm mind and you will understand the real question in a very easy sense. Cyber security vulnerabilities, they are weaknesses in organizations infrastructure like internal controls or information system yes it is supposed to be correct that is nothing but literally a translation or a definition of the cyber security vulnerability while vulnerabilities themselves are not harmful of course but they become risky when when they are targeted by the hackers that is also correct because if i if i have a vulnerability i'm not bothered if nothing happens uh, from outside because because my vulnerability itself is not making me any harm. It becomes risky when somebody uh, exploits that vulnerability and, and attacks on my system. Then the real problem is, right? And the failure to update the software with the patches can leave the system vulnerable to exploitation, obviously. And that is why every time you, you need to update, update your softwares, be, be it any software on, your, on your, any of the electronic devices or your security systems, they keep asking you to update your softwares so that the, uh, the software, the system can become more and more resilient to the cyber attacks. So do, do you need any special knowledge? No. Very simply, very basic with a common logic and basic understanding, I can solve this question. This, this is a very general question that was asked. No facts involved, nothing. So I would say this question was a very easy one. Could I have been attempted without any trouble? Answer is supposed to be C. Understood? So nothing, nothing uh, in this particular case. Nothing here that you, that you can't, uh, uh, you know, think about or you can't solve. Okay. Question number 44. This again is a very uh, fact-based question. You really have very narrow scope. To, um, to solve this question. The question is which of the following 
is the world's shortest humped breed in the cattle. I mean, it is very difficult, very difficult to make any guesswork. But let, let, what if I tell you, there is one picture that was actually that went viral. There was one picture that went viral on the internet with the Pradhan Mantri of India, the, the Mr. Modi, Modi Sahab. And he was feeding that little cows, if you remember. I'll show you the picture that then you can remember. So I'm very, very sure somewhere, somewhere, somehow, you must have seen this picture. It was a viral picture when Pradhan Mantri Modi was feeding these very short humped uh, uh, cows. And because of that, if you, if, you, if you can recall that, you know it was a cow, right? Even if you don't remember the breed, you can still remember, oh, he was feeding a cow. And that was in news because it was a very short humped breed. So I'm talking about the Punganur cows. So what you need to know about Punganur cows because it was very much viral. And that's why we expect a question coming on the Panganur cow as well. So this Panganur cows was recently news. This particular breed is actually native to the Chittor district in Andhra Pradesh. Very important information. Remember the state. You may have a question dedicatedly on that. So they may ask you the state as well. Why we need to remember why this cattle is so special? Because these dwarf cattle are the world's shortest humped breed that makes them so much into news. And they are, of course, they are of various colors. They, they, are, they, are, they can be gray shade, light, dark, brown. They can be of any shade. One thing you need to remember. These cows, they have a small crescent shaped horns. Longer in females than in the males can be asked in the, in the exam. Uh, but they are native to Andhra. But don't think they are restricted in the state of Andhra. As far as their distribution is concerned, they are available or they are distributed uh, along Andhra, Telangana, Karnataka, Kerala, Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu. So the, so the distribution is quite wide. Okay, that is, that is very important. And right now we have seen that their numbers have greatly improved. So they, they used to be less than 3000 in number, but now they are more than 13,000. So of course, they, the, we have taken good care of this cattle and they have pretty much increased their population. So here, so of course, I'm not talking about any Ibex. I'm not talking about the Kilari. You guys may have a confusion between this cattle and the cow, but that picture of Mr. Modi feeding the cows may be helpful because that was a viral picture. So answer has to be C. This question I would say was a medium one, but you, you could have attempted it or you at least could have risked it if you somehow recall that picture that I can say, uh, but now you know the information and please try to keep that information in your head so that you can use it later in your exam. Question 45. Question is with respect to the hepatitis. Why it was very much in the news. We know about the hepatitis infection, right? Hepatitis A, B, C. So these are very infectious, uh, uh, you know, uh, diseases that we have. So these infections are pretty much into, into the news recently because of a, because India has got its first vaccine. India has made its own vaccine with respect to hepatitis. So first we need to know that information, then we'll come back to the question. And there, there is absolutely a lot of things that you need to, uh, that you need to learn with respect to the hepatitis. Okay. First thing is that recently Indian immunologicals, the IIL launched the country's first indigenously developed hepatitis A vaccine called the heavy shore. So I have a few, uh, you know, few MCQs that can come from this. Number one, for example, the question can be heavy shore. What is heavy shore? So at least you have a dedicated question on that. So you now you know that it's a, it's a hepatitis A vaccine. Please remember it is just for hepatitis A. This heavy shore is not going to work on hepatitis B or hepatitis C. No, not at all. Only for hepatitis A. In fact, for hepatitis C, there is no vaccine as such. So this heavy shore is only for hepatitis A. And since this is India's first indigenously developed hepatitis vaccine, definitely this can be a part of UPSC prelims. Again, who has developed it? Because obviously, whenever you're talking about any vaccine, they will ask you the who has launched or who has developed this vaccine. The name 
Indian immunological again becomes very important. So just one line has given me two, three uh, possible MCQs and that's why the, the you can understand the question is so important. What is you need to remember if, if you are if you are not aware about the hepatitis infection, let me sum up for you in a very short way. Hepatitis is basically inflammation of the liver. It's a condition that can be self-limiting or can progress to chronic hepatitis which can lead to progressive scarring of the liver or it lead, it can lead to liver cancer as well if it is not taken care at an appropriate time. What can cause hepatitis? It can, be, it can be caused by hepatitis virus. So it's a viral infection. Understood? Please remember right here. It's a viral infection that we have. And most common causes is because of this particular virus. How it maybe because of some toxic substances, maybe use of alcohol, you, you can, uh, uh, or maybe use of certain drugs, or it can also be a, a, a consequence of the autoimmune diseases that can cause the hepatitis. When it comes to symptoms, symptoms occur uh, like you know, it, it, it initially you may have a jaundice or a dark urine or some extreme fatigue, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, all of them can be a common uh, uh, symptoms of the hepatitis. And based on that categories, we have five types of hepatitis viruses and that we, that we have classified as hepatitis A, B, C, D and E. So please remember the types, you may be asked that there are three types of hepatitis or four types of or two types of. So remember, there are five types of hepatitis uh, viruses that we have. Okay, now be careful. UPSC may trick you by saying it's a bacterial infection. So it is not a bacterial one. It's a viral infection that, that makes it so susceptible and so dangerous. So remember, if something is bacterial or viral or something like that, okay? Now, please remember, especially uh, when it comes to the human, um, you know, hepatitis A and hepatitis C, these are the two most common thing, uh, mo most common infections that we see in case of humans. So, hepatitis C virus uh, is mostly trans, it's, it's a sexual transmission is also possible, but that is less common. But in generally, hepatitis C virus uh, is transmitted through exposure to the infect infective blood that is the most common case where hepatitis c can uh, transmit but please remember very important star mark point as of now there are no vaccines for hepatitis c but when it comes to hepatitis a which is the most common type of the hepatitis that like most of the people have so there we have got the uh, vaccine and india has got this uh, heavy shore vaccine for hepatitis A. So remember these two, three things very, very importantly. Uh, please remember one more point that vaccines are available for hepatitis A, B and E so far, but there are no vaccine for C. So it's not like that we have vaccine only for A. For A, B and E, we have the vaccines, but for C, there are no vaccines. One more comparison between A, B, C that you need to remember that hepatitis A, which again, I'm talking that it's a most common one, it does not cause to chronic liver disease. But in case if somebody has hepatitis B or hepatitis C, in that case, that people, that the person is going to develop a chronic liver condition, which can be often fatal. So I can say hepatitis A, more common and less dangerous as compared to hepatitis B and hepatitis C. I hope that that, that makes sense. So now if you come back to the question, the, the statement, the question was, which of them is not correct? So my first statement is correct. Yes, sir. This is like uh, IIL has developed India's first indigenously developed hepatitis A vaccine. Have you sure? Yes. So always check if it is A. Yes, it is A. The third statement is also correct, which says, unlike hepatitis B and C, the A does not cause chronic liver disease. That is also correct. The problem is with the statement number two. Why? It says, we have vaccines for A, hepatitis C, that is not true because for C, there are no vaccines as such. So answer has to be uh, not correct, only one is not correct, answer has to be A. So always be careful if question is asking you the correct one or the incorrect one. Now in this particular case, I would say this question was a tough one because it 
really needs a good amount of information about hepatitis and all the five types. You can't do a guesswork. So it's better you take a risk only if you have some idea. Otherwise, better to skip this question because it involves and there are chances that you may end up doing some wrong uh, statement because I there is no guesswork that you can do about hepatitis A, B or C or D or E. So better you be aware of this kind of question then only attempt otherwise try not to make a blind guesswork into that. Next question is something that I can still solve with little bit of common sense. The question is with respect to the tobacco use. Tobacco use is definitely increasing throughout the world but first of all try to okay I'll, I'll get into into the details later first try to read the four statements okay very with the, with the, with a with a very common sense you can still solve most of the statements number one the question says india largest market for tobacco followed by china do you really think so we know about the chinese smoking problem in fact in china smoking is far more prominent that that than in india also given the population size of china india has just crossed them uh, uh, you know by being more popular uh, populous country than china but for so many years and we know about the problem it's not just a habit in china there is a smoking problem with lots and lots of people you know having this uh, smoking addiction so obviously china any day has larger tobacco market than india so this cannot be the right answer then statement number two says tobacco grown only in tropical regions i understand tobacco is better grown in tropical regions but the kind of conditions that are required for tobacco they can still be grown throughout the world because the kind of temperature or conditions they require you can't think you can't say that they are only and only grown in tropical regions that is that is too extreme to believe so at least you can eliminate number two and number three when it comes to number one and number four both are correct because you, you see the fourth statement the question the fourth statement makes every logic and i'm sure you being a little bit good observer you must have come across this kind of thing by yourself that there is a ban on the sale of tobacco products uh, uh, you know to any minors you can't sell officially legally as per the law you can't sell any tobacco products to anybody who is underage and uh, under the age of 18 and also within 100 year yards of the educational institutions you are not going to have any tobacco shop it's a very logical sense uh, we and because because in school or educational institutions you are not supposed to sponsor or encourage people to have tobacco addiction right so that makes every possible sense then then comes the last question which may be a little bit confusing to some people it says the southeast asian region has highest population highest percentage of the population using tobacco i can i i because i have read about southeast asia and i know if you consider myanmar you consider thailand you consider uh, uh, malaysia indonesia we know that southeast asian countries they have this habit of uh, high tobacco usage but many people of course can also co get confused because if even in eastern east asian countries like japan south korea north korea there also there is a huge uh, uh, you know population consuming the tobacco so the first statement could have been a little bit problematic for many people but like, like let me tell you the first statement is correct so first let me give you some details i have just made, made you understand how to approach this question now let's get into the detail first now this is as per the who report so who global report on the trends in the prevalence of tobacco was released recently and as per who report it was revealed it is the southeast asian region that has the highest percentage of the population using tobacco which is 26.5 percent of the total population that is using tobacco but in this particular race it's a negative race but in this particular race even european region is not far behind in europe the percentage is again 25.5 percent 25.3 percent so you see in both these regions more than one fourth population they are addicted or they are using tobacco which is a high percentage overall if you look globally if you look 
there are more than 1.25 billion people like 125 crore people right now they are aged 15 or over they are using tobacco it this percentage was pretty uh, uh, pretty much more in 2000 the percentage was let's say 1.36 billion somehow it came down because now awareness is more comparatively to the 2000 era right but still tobacco use is said to fall further and we are really hoping that happens because with more awareness the smoking trends and the tobacco trends are coming down so you can clearly see from 2000 to 2022 we have decreased and we are further aiming by 2030 it's it will still come down to 1.2 billion but of course you need to have more awareness anyways coming to the next point so i just mentioned the tobacco it is tropical in origin the tobacco is a it's a uh, kind of plant which is best if you uh, grow it in tropical region but still it can be grown throughout the world because the tobacco plants typically grow at the temperature somewhere between 20 to 30 degrees celsius and this kind of temperature is available at most of the locations on the earth even and um, and especially in the areas where there's a dry period to facilitate the harvest of the leaves so you really do not need very wet conditions so yeah it, it can uh, it can be you know can be grown at most of the parts of the world but be careful tobacco plants get damaged if there is water logging that is one pro one problem or, or if there is a if there is a high salinity level that then again uh, that damages the tobacco crop so two things needs to be avoided and i have just mentioned uh, as per the logic that this china is the largest market of tobacco followed by india and uh, we have the copta copta is one of the most important act that we have in india controlling the cigarette and tobacco products so as per the copta act the objective is to discourage the consumption of tobacco and also prohibition of smoking in public areas and that's why there is a sale on the uh, there's a ban on the sale of tobacco product to minors within 100 yards of educational um, institutions in fact there is also prohibition on direct or indirect advertising of tobacco products you 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 remember before uh, 2000 um, uh, many of the celebrities they used to endorse the cigarette products and tobacco products very openly there used to be there used to be uh, uh, you know properly advertisements coming on the on the television where i remember one of them where akshay kumar used to say hum red and white peene walo ki baat hi kuch aur hai, you know so there, there used to be direct uh, uh, advertisements endorsing smoking but of course after 2000 because it was it the 2000 year was a very watershed moment where um, uh, a lot of global reports were published that actually uh, highlighted the all the negative consequences of, of the tobacco and and especially the cigarettes and from there onwards especially after the after the making of the scott act the things were totally different then so now if you go back to the statement yes you know the answer so first and the third statements are correct first and fourth are correct second and third being incorrect so how many correct only two are there was the question easy no it was a medium kind of question can i solve it yes i can still attempt it because i have told you how to approach or logically think about the answer question number 47 very very heavily fact based question it says how many of the above species are invasive species which are commonly found in india and you are given a huge list of seven things well the answer is d all the seven are invasive species was it easy to guess no i always call it a tough one because it's purely 100 percent fact-based question how I guess i can't guess nobody can guess nobody so here the only thing is just you either go blind risk it if you if you don't have any choice or skip it that is the only thing so this is important because some questions are meant to be totally out of nowhere they can appear in your exam right but why we are asking this question why the test series has this question there is a reason behind it recently it was in news that the dense forest of tamil nadu they are facing a rapid spread of invasive plant species so the context is important and as per the convention on biological diversity the cbd 
it clearly defines the invasive species it it says invasive species means what invasive species means any alien plant animal any pathogen so don't don't think that alien species is only the plants can be plant animal or pathogens so any alien species that are non native to the ecosystem but they are introduced deliberately or accidentally but now they are causing economic and environmental harm they are adversely affecting the human health in one way or the other that is need to be called as alien species invasive alien can transform the structure can transform the species compositions since 17th century alien species contributed nearly 40% of all animal extinction you can uh, you can remember how much harmful they can be in india now there is a chance for you to remember in india there are some common invasive species which are very well known and you should learn them right now so we have the viper grass we have the lantana camara we have the uh, pro, uh, prosopis juliflora we have the water hyacinth very very uh, it is also called the terror of bengal the water hyacinth is called the terror of bengal we have the african catfish commonly mealy mealy bug and the prime primrose willow these are some of the common invasive species in india which are uh, which are a big threat now since we have mentioned about uh, uh, the invasive species that considering the level of harm that they can cause there are so many international arrangements to control the invasive alien species that includes the cbd ic target 9 uh, but right now ic targets are no more applicable we have we have got a new uh, global uh, framework on biodiversity targets so ic targets are no more applicable they expired in uh, 2020 so now you really need not to remember that but just for the information sake so we have the global invasive species program we have the convention on migratory species we have the ramsar convention we have the uncls the laws of the sea they also uh, talk about the invasive species and there are many such groups which are exclusively talking about the invasive species that brings us to the question number 48 question 48 which statement is correct now the question is with respect to the commission for air quality management q a c a q m now this question has every sense to appear in your exam why considering the air pollution problem in india there is always a chance of question coming on the air quality management now commission of for air quality management is something you need to be fully aware of what kind of body is it so first thing is first the commission for air quality management it's a statutory body means we have established it through the act of the parliament which act guys the ncr and adjoining areas act 2021 so since this statutory body is a recently established body you have every chance of coming this into the exam number 2 this particular act actually dissolved the environment Pro pollution prevention control authority established uh, in 1998 there used to be so far we used to control the air pollution of the ncr under this particular epc act but now it there is no more epc act now we have got this new act of 2021 so remember if 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 any popular act has replaced uh, any previous act that also you need to remember the chronology it's it's very important also remember few more things the chairperson of the commission is going to be a government official especially of the rank of a secretary to the government or chief secretary to the state government that is one first criteria uh, the chairperson and the members are going to have a tenure of 3 years or the age criteria of 7 70 years whatever comes first the commission has exclusive jurisdiction of the the national capital region the ncr region when i say the word ncr there there's a difference between nct and ncr nct is specifically the the political boundaries of delhi which is national capital territory the nct when i use the word ncr ncr means delhi along with 100 km radius throughout so when i say the word ncr that actually includes areas of haryana punjab up rajasthan especially in come in terms of the air pollution so you remember understand this particular commission has a very broad jurisdiction 
when it comes to the air pollution so lot of other states are also going to be under the watch of this commission important and the commission has penal powers as well so this commission can actually impose fines up to 1 crore rupees or also can announce imprisonment up to 5 years so clearly clearly the commission is very powerful it can also issue directions to the state governments what to do what not to do so now if you if you come to the question you have all the three statements as the correct one right so this commission is statutory body yes sir the act is also correct it dissolved this particular act that is also correct and the third one what kind of question i would say it's a medium kind of question it's a medium kind of question i can i can i can see the third statement is a correct one it's easy to guess because because you know you have a certain rank of secretary or something that 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 are given post for such important commissions right i can still um, make sense with the first statement of course the it is it is difficult to guess the second one so you can take a risk at least if you know the two out of three statements you can still take a risk in this case the answer is c and now i told you the the, the reason so air pollution itself is a very important topic so better you uh, prepare uh, the topic of air pollution very well and all the legislative bodies associated with it next question 49 was with this it was a match of the following kind of question on the left side you were given some of the schedules on the right side you have to tell which protection is there let me tell you the background first so far you have you have seen we have got the wildlife protection act under the wildlife protection act 1972 there used to be six schedules not the four schedules but recently you know the government in 2022 government has amended the wildlife protection act and there from six we have reduced the schedules to four and we have added one special schedule to accommodate the species or specimens of sites so what exactly we need to know this is a very important question because wildlife protection act is one landmark a uh, legislation that we have when it comes to the protection of the wildlife in india so why this question first this uh, understanding this context is very important in 2022 the central government amended this wildlife protection act 72 and now we have only four there used to be six schedules but now there are only four schedules in fact this act was amended because there was a specific requirement india was under the obligation to include the specimens of uh, sites uh, that like there is a there is a uh, there is a uh, convention on sites which talks about the endangered species so to accommodate that there was a requirement because india is a party to the sites and that's why it was a required it was a requirement to include those species and that's why india uh, modified amended all the schedules now as per the new rules i'm talking about the wildlife protection act 2022 as per the new act we have the four schedules where schedule 1 says all the animals that are going to enjoy the highest level of protection schedule 2 is again going to be with respect to animals but those animals which are subjected to less degree of protection means they are still have a good number they really we really do not have to be bothered about their decrease of course which particular animal is going to get the highest level of protections whose numbers are declining especially those categories which which are in uh, endangered or critically endangered or you know that kind of list then you have schedule 3 that relates to the plant species protection only the plant species that needs to be protected are put in schedule 3 and schedule 4 talks about the specimens listed in appendices under the sites remember as per the old act there used to be one schedule which which used to talk about the vermin species vermin species which can be culled uh, uh, which can be culled which can be killed in case uh, there is an infection in those species but right now there is that provision has been removed there used to be part so no more vermin kind of thing here so please remember that okay and uh, uh, what ex what exactly is sites you may have a question coming on the sites as well so site is basically it's an international agreement between the between the governments 
to ensure the international trade in specimens of the wild plant animal does not threaten the survival of the species because you know in uh, because in the global trade a lot of times you have the illegal illegal trade within the uh, protected species right and to control that you have the sites under the sites the plant animals are classified into the three categories based on their threat of threat of their extinctions and accordingly we now are going to accommodate that site species we have to include okay and just to give you an idea the importance of wildlife protection act you know there are so many establishments we have got under the wildlife protection act be it your national park wildlife uh, sanctuaries everything every conservative effort that we do it actually comes all the national park all the wildlife sanctuaries that we have in india they are all under this wildlife protection act in fact the central zoo authority was constructed uh, established under the wildlife protection act and even the indian board of wildlife and even the ntca the national tiger conservation authority that we established 1973 was also under the wpa so you now you remember the importance is of great level so now if you look at the question now you have to figure out um, i think i think uh, you this question should have been little bit more uh, specific it must have must have told you it must have told you that we are talking about the 22 2022 provision so this has to be somewhere mentioning of 2022 because of course otherwise there are two set of schedules schedule of 72 act and 2022 act but here considering it to 2022 all the four are absolutely correct we have just learned about it so it's a very fact based question very fact based you can't really do any guess work it it was the question was a tough one but you could have attempted only if you have learned about it and you must learn about it because it's very important act otherwise you can take a little bit of risk but yeah um the question was supposed to be part of your preparation right so now you know the four things as well the next question is typical question of economics the question is which statement accurately describe the lorenz curve in economics can you do any guess work no sir there are no guess work you can't do it's economics it's a fact based subject it's a pure concept based subject what is a lorenz curve now there is a chance for us to learn and pray that the same comes in the uh, exam as well right so what what exactly is the meaning of lorenz curve lorenz curve is basically it's a graphical representation of the distribution of the income or the wealth within the population so basically if you look at this uh, uh, diagram in front of you it's a, it's a curve diagram in front of you and you see the blue line here this 45 degree line the blue line is actually line of equality if i if if on a on a on a uh, graph if i have to plot the population and the percentage of the income and if that line comes straight means the the income is equally distributed but that is not the case because in reality it's very difficult it's very like very very hypothetical to understand or imagine the incomes are equally divided they are not because beat any society you always are going to have some income in inequalities and this lorenz curve actually denotes those income inequalities you see the red line here this is your lorenz curve now in this case the red line lorenz curve actually shows that how much deviation is there from the income equality if this is to be income equality and if the curve is going like that it tells you how much inequality do we have in terms of wealth income distribution right a straight line the blue line means perfect equality the more curved it is it becomes more inequal in terms so lorenz curve tells you about the inequality in terms of income in terms of wealth now i'm sure whenever you have read about the income inequality you must have also uh, learned about the gini coefficient very very important concept it's a very relatable concept so gini so this if blue is the line of equality and lorenz curve tells you about the inequality how much inequality the number the number is given by this particular area a that is your gini coefficient gini coefficient is nothing but the gap between that line of equality and line of inequality you see that guys right 
so between that line of equality and inequality this particular gap this is where you have the gini coefficient because we so now we are we are trying to um, uh, we are trying to represent the inequality with some number so gini coefficient is actually that number that quantifies how much household income distribution deviates from the perfect equality so lorentz curves just gives you a pattern of equality or inequality gini coefficient actually gives you a value of that inequality because when we calculate gini coefficient uh, we always consider the difference between the lorentz curves and the line of equality and gini coefficient has a score has a value between 0 to 1 if there is value 0 0 means perfect equality it's good to have as less as possible so the more the value is near the zero it means good equal in uh, income equality if it is one signifies perfect inequalities so the more higher number you have on gini coefficient it's bad for economic distribution the less the number of gini coefficient good better income equality that we have understood that that is absolutely important so these two Lorentz curve and Gini coefficient needs to be prepared simultaneously. It needs to be learned uh, within uh, like uh, from each other's perspective. So now if you come to the question Lorentz curve. So is it about elasticity of the remark? See I can't you can't do any guesswork here. So answer is supposed to be C. Now you know the Lorentz curve depicts cumulative distribution of income within the population right it's not about any optimal production it's not about marginal utility of the goods not about the demand of the luxury goods it is about the income wealth distribution so now you have the answer how the question was question was a medium one but not subjected to the guesswork so you if you are absolutely no idea if you are absolutely clueless Please don't do the guesswork. Don't make a blind guess. Better to skip because it's a pure question based on facts. So really you have to be careful about it. That brings us to the question number 51. So question number 51, what does it say? Question 51 says, so you have the type of the wetlands in front of you and about their characteristics, right? So when you talk about the wetlands, we know what the wetlands are. But even wetlands has many categories. We have swamps, we have marshes, we have bogs. But again, you really have to be good with your facts, right? So whenever we have to define the term wetlands, we know about it. Wetlands are nothing but the areas of marsh or the peatland where the water is static. So as per this is as per the Ramsar definition. The best definition of the wetland is under the Ramsar Convention. So as per the Ramsar Convention 1972, wetlands are defined as the marshy areas the peatland areas where the water can be static can be flowing water can be fresh brackish or saline right but the main point is that the depth of the wetland should not be should not exceed more than six meter the depth should be less than six meter at a low tide level not a high tide but a low tide level wetlands are generally considered as a transition zone now this is a new word for you that I want you guys to remember. When, whenever you, in, in ecology, whenever there is a transition zone between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem. So let's say this is my land, land gets over here and the water starts. So this particular area, which is a transition between pure land to pure water. This is called your transition zone. In ecology, we call it as ecotone. So wetlands are actually qualifies to be a ecotone. Wetlands are usually rich in nutrients because it has it has the nutrients of both nutrients of land and nutrients of the water since it's getting the nutrient from both the kind of ecosystems they are usually rich in nutrients and that's why they have abundant growth of aquatic macrophytes Aqu uh, aquatic macrophyte means aquatic plants large enough that we can see with our naked eyes right talking about the types of the wetlands you have four important types we have the marshes swamp bog ferns these are the four major types of the wetlands marshes are frequently continually inundated with the water like you always have water covering those areas so it's like overflowing water there so uh, marshes are those areas which are mostly emerged um, and um, you know 
they are adapted to the saturated soil conditions tidal salt marshes fresh water can be both swamps are any wetland dominated by the by the woody plants if you have lot of woody plants in that area that that is going to be called as swamp bogs are basically spongy peat deposits bogs are known for acidic waters uh, the floor covered by thick carpet of the of some moss uh, kind of thing fens are peat forming wetlands receiving nutrient from the sources other than the precipitation fens comparatively to the bogs are less acidic and they have high nutrient level so yes you you can have a look here so we have a picture for you where you can easily understand the difference so this is your marsh this is a marsh area swamps i told you there has to be woody plants so you see if you have these kind of woody plants so that is considered to be a swampy area or swamps right bogs you have understood bogs are spongy peat deposits so you have this kind of deposits so that that qualifies to be bogs and they are always going to be acidic in nature fens are like this less acidic high nutrient levels okay so remember try to remember these four names can be important because wetlands are very much in the news especially in the last 2 3 years wetlands are important topic for you to prepare in this case guys all the three are correct so bogs uh, bogs are spongy peat yes sir marshes we have learned they are frequently or continually inundated with the water means water is always overflowing them and swamp very important keyword is the woody plant so this question was a was a easy one was a straight forward definition based could have been attempted easily answer is c all the three are correct you just have to be good with the fact in this question and wetland is very important that you have to prepare next question you don't have to be expert you can solve it with your with the common sense you think of the polar bear think of the polar bear and the first thing that comes to your mind is the arctic area isn't it guys the first thing that comes to your mind is the arctic areas because polar bears belong to the northern hemisphere the arctic areas it's a very well known fact so look at the first statement it says polar bears live primarily in the southern hemisphere possible no so in southern hemisphere in antarctica we have the penguins we have the penguins in southern hemisphere right i'm not saying all the penguins majority of the penguins because there are some penguins which are also in northern hemisphere but majority of the penguins in southern hemisphere in, in northern hemisphere we have the polar bears so yeah first statement needs to be incorrect and considering the options i am only have only one option which says statement 1 is incorrect so logically I, i have got my answer without even reading the second statement i have got my answer as the answer has to be d and logically also if you if you read statement number 2 is going to be correct anyways because polar bears have thick layer of the fat of course they do below the surface that act as as an insulation on the body to trap the heat that's why they can survive at as extreme temperatures of the arctic with such cold conditions they can survive easily because they have huge fat layer and that's why the size is so big right so my answer has to be d was it difficult one no sir easy easily could have been attempted only fact i need to know i know and we we all know about it polar bears they live in the arctic areas right sir so answer has to be d sometimes the questions are just cake walk no just to give you a little bit more information about the polar bears you never know you have a question on that so polar bears are largest carnivore land animals only bear species to have considered marine mammals they live most of their life in the arctic ocean or the ice on that they occur north of the arctic <coughs> circle very few times they come south of the arctic polar bears you will find in the in the areas of alaska canada russia greenland some northern islands owned by norway like for example Sval svalbard svalbard is an island which is a part of arctic region only clearly they are not found in antarctic region very common proven fact okay okay so so and yeah talking about the categories remember one thing when it comes to polar bears their conservation status is vulnerable they are part of the appendix 2 of the sites brings us to the question number 53 the great indian bustard very very important very very uh, famous bird that we know in india okay 
okay sir so what facts i need to know about the great indian booster let's have a let's have a discussion on that first so here this beautiful bird is what you call as a great indian booster there are many boosters and one famous out of them is the great indian booster it's a large bird yes sir it's a large bird with a horizontal body long bare legs and give like a ostrich like of appearance that is the that's the speciality of the great indian bustard more to that it's a state bird of rajasthan so please remember the state name is absolutely important upsc can confuse you by saying it's a state bird of haryana state bird of gujarat state bird of himachal state bird of andhra could have been any but no you remember great indian bustard is a state bird of rajasthan we need to remember that fact plus remember that great indian bustard the gib we call it as gib great indian bustard it is endemic to the indian subcontinent and they are one of the heaviest flying birds in the world this makes them really unique one of the heaviest flying birds in the world great indian bustards are considered to be a flagship grassland species means if you are great indian bustard in a grassland that represent the health of the grassland ecology if in any grassland you don't have these birds that means that actually means the grassland ecological health is not good so such species are called the flagship species that tells you about the uh, the health of the ecosystem in which they live the great indian bustard are the largest among the four bustard species other than this we have species like called the hobara bustard less florican bengal florican and the gib that we have in india so in india there are four types of bustards that we have primarily they are terrestrial birds that really they don't really spend most of the time with flying no they are called terrestrial birds birds because they spend most of the time on the ground with very occasional flights to travel from one place to another but they are mostly roaming uh, here where do we found bustards in india so they are found they are scattered throughout indian state we have we have in state of rajasthan which is the state bird of rajasthan itself in gujarat maharashtra andhra and karnataka these are the areas they mostly are found in dry and semi dry grassland because that's their favorite place they are omnivorous they can feed on on the insect on the grass they can on even reptiles what we are interested in knowing about the great indian bustard because unfortunately they are critically endangered and that's why we are focusing so much on these birds remember they are diurnal bird diurnal bird means they usually active in the early morning and even in the evening hours remaining time during the day time they they take a rest early morning evening hours they are very active so few facts that you need to remember and since they are critically endangered that makes them even more important for the upsc preparation guys so remember their iucn status so first statement correct sir second statement correct third statement absolutely correct question was a easy one this could have been attempted very straightforward without any trouble because great indian bustard is a very common and important species that we have in our syllabus next question was a difficult one because it's not a very common statement the question is with respect to the gram negative bacteria there are two type of bacteria one is gram positive bacteria one is gram negative bacteria so what i need to know about it let's first understand the concept right that that is very important so remember uh, the bacteria are of two types gram positive gram negative what is the difference i'll tell you see if you compare the gram negative and gram positive bacteria first of all compare their outer membrane gram negative bacteria is having there is a presence of outer membrane if this is your bacteria it is always going to have an outer covering there has to be outer membrane for gram negative which is absent in case of gram positive bacteria now please apply your common sense if any bacteria is having an outer coverage if it is having some outer covering along it uh, 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 you know so obviously it is going to be more resistant if something like if you compare the two with or without outer membrane obviously if if i give any medicine or anything to this of course this is going to be more resistant this is a negative bacteria 
comparatively if there is no outer membrane i can impact or influence that bacteria comparatively easily no so gram negative bacteria because there is a presence of outer membrane generally they are more resistant as as far as uh, uh, comparatively the gram positive because there is absent absence of outer membrane they are more susceptible remember when you when you uh, you know apply any chemical experiment on that gram negative bacteria after gram staining with some chemicals give a red pink color where the purple or the blue color is common common with the positive bacteria it's absolutely important guys common example if somebody asks you sir what are the common ex common types of gram negative bacteria so you must have heard of the term e coli so e coli salmonella these are some common gram negative bacteria they are very resistant bacteria if you compare the gram positive bacteria you have the uh, streptococcus pneumoniae all these are the positive gram positive bacteria that we have it's a very important comparison guys now now if you compare now if you know little bit further about the bacteria a gram negative bacteria which is resistant remember with the outer covering they are enclosed in a protective capsule right that's that's what i use the word as outer membrane since they are having this protective capsule that we have this capsule help prevent the white blood cells because if you have this protecting covering you really the immune system can't really fight that kind of bacteria the medicine can't really fight that kind of bacteria so gram positive are more susceptible to antibiotics where the gram negative bacteria are more resistant they are going to be more resistant to the antibiotic this is as simple as that right now if you if you compare come back to the question 54 if you if you look at the statements you will see it both statements are incorrect the gram negative bacteria they are susceptible no they are more resistant to antibiotics and outer membrane is present in case of gram negative bacteria why see understand why the name is negative the name negative means they are they are difficult to deal with understood remember it this way why they are called negative because they are more dangerous they are more harmful it's it's more difficult to treat them that's why the, that that's why they are given the notation as gram negative bacteria so which statement is correct none of the statements are answer has to be d question was a tough one i do not deny that um you really cannot do any guess work here but understanding the term negative or decoding the term negative bacteria you can still you can still make a little bit of guess work and can risk it why it why it it is called as negative if you if you consider or think like that why the name negative is given probably probably you can still at least risk this question otherwise you have to skip and you can't skip everything so you have to take little bit of risk next question is about the reports so there are five reports given you were supposed to figure out how many of them are published by world economic forum very common kind of question upsc is fond of these kind of question where they will give you report they will uh, talk about the indexes and they will ask you which of the following publishes the report indexes or something like that it's a very common favorite topic of the upsc let me tell you guys now we're talking about the world economic forum it's a important forum and it is very much in the news more often and that's why you need to know about it you need to uh, remember few facts about it so it was basically uh, there was a german professor called uh, klaus schwab so klaus schwab was the professor that founded the world economic forum way back in 1971 initially it used to be called as european management forum but now later on it was renamed as a world economic forum with headquarters at geneva switzerland world economic forum is important and very prominently known because it was this forum introduced the concept of the stakeholder capitalism now the world economic forum publishes a lot of reports and these are the major five reports published by world economic forum it talks about the global competitiveness report global gender gap energy transition global it report travel and tourism how can you remember it you really have to cram it you really have to cram 
with little bit of logic like economic forum oh it, if it is economic must be talking about competitiveness must be talking about travel tourism but most of the things you really have to cram there's no other choice i have just used a word as stakeholder capitalism you may have a question separately coming on that because this is an important concept associated with the world economic forum as per the forum stakeholder capitalism means philosophy company should serve all its stakeholders not just its shareholders there's a difference shareholder and stakeholders shareholder need not to be, uh, uh, every stakeholder need not to be a shareholder because when i say the shareholder employ supplier community is a part of it so stakeholder capitalism means a company has to take care of all the stakeholders not just the shareholders because shareholders are actually the the those people financing or capitalizing that company but stakeholders can be everyone your employee is a stakeholder your supplier is a stakeholder they may not be having your shares they may not have purchased your shares but they are still the stakeholders understood so this is important so if you uh, look at the question all five it's a it's a fact based question here so all five are correct which is very rare let me tell you in such in such questions it's very very rare that you have all the five as a correct one so when when such kind of question comes to your um, comes to your exam be very careful very rarely you have all the five as correct here the answer is d question was a tough one yes sir it was a tough one can i attempt it blindly you can't attempt it blindly you can risk it risk it but in case you are totally blank totally you have absolutely no idea you can skip but i suggest you guys at least try to uh, read about the reports of all the important global organizations like for example this world economic forum world bank imf you know uh, who all these important global bodies try to read about the reports and uh, like uh, also of the unep a lot of reports come from unep so at least at least these famous 5 7 10 bodies at least these reports should be on your tips you can't skip it no so my suggestion before you go to the exam try to uh, read read the reports the name of the reports of all these major famous uh, international organizations the next question is with respect to the this is again economics the question is with respect to the momentum investing what exactly is momentum investing very important question which statement is correct you have to figure out so momentum investing okay now let's try to learn about this so momentum investing if you simply break down it the the definition so generally the term momentum investing refers a style of investing where investors purchase the assets like stocks or the bonds that are consistently rising in the price while selling those where the prices are falling it's a very very common way it's a layman way of investing i would say if let's say if i if i see the there's a price of uh, uh, adani uh, share any of the other adani's company and if i see the price is increasing 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 so believing that this trend is increasing going to go up only i'm not interested in any of the analysis i'm i have not read about any of the balance sheets purely based on the trends of the prices if i am investing that's called momentum investing because what momentum it's the momentum of the price price falling price rising i keep purchasing keep purchasing believing the prices will go further up i'm selling 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 believing the prices are continuously going to fall so momentum investing is something that is actually rising in indian stock market these days such investors purely invest based on the price trend not by any analysis not by any balance sheet in uh, understanding nothing at all this simply the simple uh, this is a simple way where they they purchase or sale based on the prices so if now you look at the question if you go back to the question 56 you have the options in front of you so what exactly is the momentum investing sir so it refers to the style yes sir it is rising in india and all the three are correct now if you had to guess this out so obviously if you simply translate the meaning or try to decode the meaning of the term if you have no choice but to attempt it then by simply decoding the term 
you can still find a way to give the guesswork because momentum is what I'm I'm investing based on some kind of momentum generated due to prices or the trends a lot of people investing into that okay I should also invest into that a lot of people selling this stock I should also sell this stock this this is the kind of momentum investing that is there so I that because the question was definitely a tough one but still could have been taken a little bit of risk considering that I have a choice to eliminate with this kind of question where you have this choice of elimination you can still take a risk at least because as per the latest trend the chances of elimination becomes really limited next question we have is a very specific question I don't have any guesswork because it talks about the Himalayan wolf and it talks about all the facts associated with that the question is which statement is not correct it's a pure heavily fact based question you can't really do any guesswork so first try to learn few things about the Himalayan wolf you see I know this looks more like a dog but actually it's in it's an interesting fact that you need to know about the Himalayan wolf Himalayan wolves are prominent lupine predators that we have in Himalayas okay they are thought to be ancestors of the domestic dogs and that's why pro probably they look more like them no they are genetically genetically distinct from the gray wolf gray wolves are altogether genetically different varieties himalayan wolves are not gray wolves himalayan wolves are ancestors of the domestic dog this is one fact you need to remember second thing since they are living since they live at uh, such high altitudes they live in himalayas of course genetically they have adapted themselves to live in that low oxygen conditions and that's why that's why they generally avoid they don't really love or they don't really like to uh, live in a dense forest they they always avoid those dense forest and deep snow zones that is not their favorite area they're where they want to go and live um, again very interesting point talking about the Himalayan wolves now they can be found in Ladakh also they are found in Tibetan plateau also also the uh, some of the mountains of Central Asia look at this complete area guys this is the complete area where you have the presence of Himalayan wolves so don't really think that they are only restricted in India Himalayan wolves have this great distribution their IUCN status is vulnerable sites protection level is appendix 1 they are larger then Indian and European wolves remember that so as per the size is concerned the Himalayan wolves are larger in size than uh, Indian and European wolves so can I do any guesswork in that no sir it's it's this kind of question is very very fact based heavily fact based question here which statement not correct sir so this is not correct they are not endemic to Himalayan we, we have seen they are also present in Himalayas uh, Tibet plateaus, Ladakh, Central Asian mountains. So they are not limited to Himalayan region. They do. Do you see them in dense forests? No. They avoid. They avoid dense forests and deep sea zones. So two and three are incorrect. Answer is only two. Not correct. Only two are not correct. First is correct. Question tough because it's a fact-based question. Can I attempt it? No. Should I risk it? No. Better to skip. If you have no idea, better to skip because there are more chances of you getting it wrong next question is national skill development corporation very interesting question very important question in fact but what do i need to know first about the national skill development corporation and how to eliminate this question let's understand so as per the national skill development national skill development corporation first thing is first that is it's a non-profit it, it's not for profit public limited company number one and we have got it in 2008 Ministry of Finance set up this National Skill Development Corporation as a public private partnership model yes it's not a pure government company it's a public private partnership model where 49% share is with the government and private sector has a 51% share understood guys the this company the national skill development corporation aims to promote the skill development by creating for-profit vocational institutions but 
again with the along with the private side because there's a partnership and private plan remember this is important fact private sector has more share than the government government through msdc it is the ministry of education and skill development entrepreneurship through this we have 49 percent share recently this national skill development corporation was in news because they have launched a program called skills on wheel program okay now do remember do uh, 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 brace yourself that you may have a question coming directly on this as an mcq you may have a question coming on skills on wheel because this program is quite recent what this program is about guys the skill on the wheels program was actually a, a, a plan that was that comes from the nsdc and it is the indus ind bank that is going to implement so always remember implementing agencies are important for any program who has made that program who is going to implement that program what that program is all about the aim objectives these three things are absolutely important so over the five years the the objective of the skill on wheels next five years we are going to train 60,000 rural youth. So please remember this target, the, the, the program is exclusively with respect to the rural youth. So next five years, we are going to train them, especially to take the industrial relevant skills, improve their theoretical and practical knowledge. This is a customized bus with retrofitted tools to promote the Skill India mission. So overall skills on wheels is actually a part of skill india development skill india mission but targeting the youth of the rural india and here why it is called skills on the wheels because this is actually a bus which will go from one village to the another giving skills to the rural youth that's why the the name is skills on the wheels which statement are correct guys all the three statements are correct here all the three are correct so of course this question was a medium level but really you really have to be careful while attempting it you can risk this question risk why because uh, uh, but but why i'm saying very careful because again uh, it's it's really important that you remember who are implementing it what is the percentage share it is it's not that easy to guess this i can guess the first statement no problem i can say okay fine a national skill development corporation is about promoting skill first is easy to guess but when it comes to second and third be little careful and try to uh, try to be more logical here so yeah you can take a risk but uh, be very very careful with this question because the percentage a lot of things are involved <clears throat> question number 459 minimum alternative tax called mat which statements are correct with respect to mat let's try to understand the first thing is what is a mat we need to understand minimum alternative as the name says minimum alternative tax means see there was a, the, like what companies usually do usually companies make profit but they shift their profit to less taxing domains or territories or the countries which is called the base erosion profit sharing now many companies they make a profit and they shift all the profit to the subsidiary of theirs that subsidiary is located on any of the tax heaven kind of location where there are minimum or no taxes so that was one big problem that that we were faced especially in the case of the mncs mncs were very much doing that now that's why this minimum alternative tax was created to bring that zero tax paying companies within the ambit of the income tax and make them pay at least a minimum amount of the tax to the government so that they are not able to shift all the profits leaving the governments uh, uh, having some loss in terms of taxations this concept is not a new one in india it was 1986-87 when this concept was introduced that time we decided there has to be 15.75% as a mat that companies has to give. Of course, later on, later on, this uh, uh, provision was discontinued. Then it was reintroduced in India in 1996-97. And that time, the minimum alternative tax was reduced from 15.75 to 11.87. 
and we also have has developed a concept of mat credit it's the difference between the tax the company pays under the mat and the regular tax so you may be asked about the mat credit as well so the purpose is very clear we really do not want companies to shift their profit leaving us uh, uh, you know in in some kind of problem so you have the options in front of you so i at least by understanding what is minimum alternative tax i can still make a guess work first statement makes all the sense that why why this what kind of tax is it's going to be so easy to remember second one is very fact based how will you guess if it is if the budget is correct or not it is difficult to guess how can you guess the rate very difficult to guess so be careful with that okay even even this third statement is easy to guess what can be the minimum alternative tax credit credit like what could be that it must be some kind of difference and logically this this difference makes all the all the sense to me but again uh, guessing the second work was a difficult one but here in this case all the three how many are correct all the three are correct the question was a medium question but it's not something you could have attempted like blindly be careful with the star mark you can take a risk because at least two out of three are easy to guess huh so all the three are correct in this particular case now we have the last question to discuss which is question number 60 guys question number 60 is with respect to the free trade agreement <clears throat> now few statements out of the four are easy to guess and i'm sure during the preparation of your upsc during your preparation you guys must have heard about the fta quite few times the question is with is with respect to the fta free trade agreement okay now let's learn about it and then we'll come back so what is an what is an fta guys free trade agreements are nothing but the agreements between the two or the more countries or the economic blocks right that's how it's a it's a uh, between the countries two or more countries we sign the fta why it is signed aim of the fta is simple to facilitate more trade and eliminate or reduce the barriers to the Uh, to the to that uh, uh, trade if i and you want to do some trade i want to import export things between us of course there's one big challenge that how much taxes you are going to put on my goods or how much taxes i am going to put on your goods if you and me agree to reduce our taxes to minimum level make it as limited as possible so that the the, the we both of both of us can make some good profit and do more of our trade because we are going to implement less less taxes on each other right it's a very important common sense kind of question so the aim is very simple facilitate the trade how eliminating or reducing the taxes to the minimum level one good example of the fta is nafta the north african free trade agreement also when you talk about the fta it actually define defines the criteria for determining the country of the origin of the product within the fta there is also the concept that every country has to showcase uh, the country of the origin of that particular product you see it's made in china made in india we always put there no it's one of the requirement of the fta it actually helps the helps to prevent the third party goods from taking advantage of the agreement that is why every pro product that you see always there is a mark in which country that product is being made because let's say if you if uh, your country and my country are having the fta i don't want a third country to take advantage of that so there has to be specifically mentioned that this product belongs or manufactured or originated in which country so that only the 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 agreed countries are going to take the benefit also the fta addresses the non tariff barriers to trade for example quotas licensing requirement technical standard even these are covered under the fta not just the not only the trade barriers but not not only the tariff barriers but non tariff also so so try to remember it this way fta take care of all the tariff barriers and also the non tariff barriers remember it both ways why we are discussing about it because recently india signed the trade economic trade and economic partnership agreement a kind of fta with four non european bloc countries iceland norway liechtenstein and switzerland you may have a separate question on that as well guys the question can be that india recently signed tapa with which of the following countries so remember these four iceland norway liechtenstein and switzerland with these four 
India recently signed the TEPA, which is a kind of FT only. Okay, so remember these four. So now if you look at the question, barring the exception of the last one, because obviously I, I remember it's not easy to guess the name of the countries right. Other than the four, I think there is absolutely no problem guessing the first three. Simple, very simple statements, very straightforward questions with a common sense logic, you can at least agree on the first three. And if that is the case, if this is a medium level question, you still has a you still are in a position to take a risk because at least you have decoded the three as an easy statement. Fourth, you can take a little bit, bit of risk on that. So here the answer is D, all the four are correct. So I really hope guys that you have enjoyed the video. You have, you have learned a lot of new things from this video. See you guys with the part number four very, very soon. So stay tuned with our channel. Let me know in the comment section box the feedback of this discussion and the video and all my best wishes for your upcoming exam. This is Ashish Malik signing off. Take care. God bless you. See you guys in part number four very, very soon.